First, my argument from the origin of the universe. Here, Dr. Cook takes the astonishing position that the universe doesn't need a cause, that something can come into being out of nothing. Now, I submit to you that that takes more faith to believe in than to believe in God. Kai Nielsen, whom he quoted as an atheist philosopher, and Nielsen says this, suppose you suddenly hear a loud bang, and you ask me, what made that bang? And I reply, nothing. <laughs> it just happened. <laughs> Nielsen says, you wouldn't accept that. In fact, you would find my reply quite unintelligible. <laughs> well, what's true of the little bang is also true of the big bang as well. There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. To think that things can pop into existence uncaused out of nothing is worse than magic. But, Dr. Cook says, why I think it's the Christian God? I'm not claiming with this argument that it is the Christian God. This argument gives us a creator of the universe, and this is consistent with uh, Islam, with Judaism, with Christianity, with Deism, with certain theistic forms of Hinduism. So my case is a cumulative one. What this does, however, do is to narrow the focus to the world's great monotheisms that believe in a transcendent personal creator of the universe, and therefore this is an important first plank in our case. Second, I argue that God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life, and there's been no response to this argument in tonight's debate. This is an argument that is very much in the press today, uh, very much a matter of discussion among physicists and cosmologists, and I think that the best explanation is that there, the universe appears to be fine-tuned for the uh, existence of life because it is fine-tuned for the existence of life by a transcendent designer of the laws of nature. Thirdly, the moral argument for God's <coughs> existence. Again, the, Dr. Cook seems to agree with my first premise that if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. He says, moral values are just cases of reciprocal altruism. Now that's a fancy way of saying, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And this type of altruistic behavior is exhibited in the animal kingdom. In a troop of baboons, for example, uh, they exhibit altruistic behavior because natural selection has determined that this is advantageous in the struggle for survival. The species will survive more effectively if altruistic behavior is selected for by natural selection. So this, again, just underlines the fact that human morality is nothing more than a sociobiological spin-off if there is no God. Stephen Pinker of Harvard University in an article uh, in January of this year writes, the scientific outlook has taught us that some parts of our subjective experience are products of our biological makeup and have no objective counterpart in the world the tastiness of fruit and the foulness of carrion, the scariness of heights and the prettiness of flowers are features of our common nervous system, and if our species had evolved in a different ecosystem, or if we were missing a few genes, our reactions could go the other way. Now, if the distinction between right and wrong is also a product of brain wiring, why should we believe it is any more real? And if it is just a collective hallucination, how could we argue that evils like genocide and slavery are wrong for everyone rather than just distasteful to us? And this is the horror, frankly, of an atheistic world. It becomes, as Nietzsche saw, a morally indifferent, morally neutral universe in which all things are permitted. There is no objective right and wrong, no objective good and evil, uh, with all of the uh, deleterious consequences of that. And I think that in our moral experience, we do apprehend objective moral values. And if you agree with me that, for example, torturing a child is wrong, objectively wrong, then I think you will agree with me that God exists. <laughs> because it follows logically from the two premises. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Objective moral values exist. It follows logically and inescapably that God exists. What about the argument for the resurrection of Jesus? He rightly says that Jesus was a Jew, and I'm glad to hear him affirm the Jewishness of Jesus. Oddly, he cites uh, Geza Vernish, 
uh, on, on Jesus. What he didn't realize is that Geza Vermesh, a Jewish scholar, affirms the historicity of the empty tomb of Jesus. Vermesh uh, recognizes the facts that I've talked about tonight. Similarly, Ludemann, he's quite right, is an atheist. And that's why, for those of you who know the literature, will know that the people I'm quoting in support of my case are not people on my side. I quote people on the other side so as to not be accused of stacking the deck. And Ludemann, whom I quoted, agrees that the disciples, in groups and individuals, did experience these post-mortem appearances of Jesus. He says, this is historically certain. The question then is, how do you best explain it? And I've debated with Ludemann on this. We've, we've published a book together on this. And I don't know of any better explanation than the one that the disciples gave that uh, God raised Jesus from the dead. I would point out, in support of my contention that this is the consensus, uh, a broad consensus of scholarship, that in the uh, journal Dialogue uh, from uh, two years ago, uh, there was a bibliographical article that surveyed 1,400 articles over the last 25 years on the resurrection of Jesus. And it showed that 75% of scholars writing on the subject agree on the historicity of Jesus' empty tomb, and there is near universal agreement on the post-mortem appearances and the origin of the disciples' uh, belief in Jesus' resurrection. So the only question is how do you best explain these? Finally, the immediate experience of God, again, has been yet to be addressed in tonight's debate. God is real to me. I, I experience God as a personal reality in my life. In the absence of some good argument for atheism, why should I regard my experience as delusory? Am I not within my rational rights to believe in God on the basis of my experience, just as I am in my rational rights to believe in the reality of the external world, or the reality of the past, on the basis of my experience of those realities? So I think we've got five good arguments for the existence of God. No compelling arguments to show that belief in God is false, and therefore I think we have good grounds for thinking that God exists. I'm very, very glad that Dr. Craig has a religious experience of God. I am. I'm very glad. And I have no intention or desire or interest in any way to call that into question or to say that it shouldn't be a reality for him. This is the point I don't think he's, he's grasping. This is one of the reasons why I've been arguing using Christian scholars. It's interesting, Dr. Craig's been arguing with all the atheists and I've been arguing with the Christians. Why, why have I been arguing using the Christian scholars? It's not an, an argument of, for authority. If it is, then his account using the atheists is presumably the same thing. I'm, use, I'm quoting the other Christians to sh simply to show that Dr. Craig's notion of God is not the only job in town. And that most of the prominent, uh, highly respected Christian theologians of the 20th century realized that you can't look towards some account of the universe and say, well, this is how God did it all. They're, this is what they understood. This was what people like Schweitzer and, and Kong and the others understood. That God is, is a personal experience. And it's got to be understood in those terms. Rather than throwing out some projection of God onto the universe and saying, my projection of God onto the universe is the true one. I'm sorry that doesn't wash. It doesn't wash. It's got moral connotations of intolerance and absolutism. And all the best of the 20th century theologians were anxious um, um, above all things about the consequences of intolerance and absolutism. Albert Schweitzer moved away from the dogmatic prescription of Christian dogma and talked about the reverence for life. And this was without any respect, any regard to Christian dogma. And unlike other people, this wasn't just a pious slogan. As you know, he went out and lived in Africa and worked among African people. I'm not in the slightest bit interested in debating 
questions about, about which I am not qualified to speak, about how the universe began. All I'm saying to you 